Good morning, Gateway. Good to see you here this morning. Let's all stand together as we sing. In I've a thousand stories of what I think you're like, but I've heard a tender whisper of love. Dead of night and you tell me that you'll please the name. Good father, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you, it's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am, and I've seen many searching for Yeah. 
turn this thing around. God turn it around. God turn it around. God turn it around. I'm calling on the name that changes everything. God turn it around. God turn it around. God turn it around. It's all of my hope is in the name, in the name of Jesus. God turn it around, 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 God turn it allows you to put your own prayer into that song. 
If your marriage is struggling, ask God to turn it around. If you have a child who's wayward, ask God to turn that child around. If you have a country that is facing national elections next year with predicted chaos as a result, can we ask God to turn that around? Amen. Every day, uh, every Thursday in chapel here, we pray about a particular subject or theme or issue that I bring before us. And today, I'm asking us as a seminary to pray for our country and to pray for elections next week and to pray that God will intervene and bring glory to himself. So turn to a person next to you, maybe two or three. And let's take a moment to pray together about this election season, and then I'll lead us to prayer as a group. Now praying together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of praying this morning about this season our country is living through. Father, next week are elections in which many people will make important decisions about who will lead our country from local elections uh, to national offices. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that you will ra raise up people of wisdom, integrity, and who will promote justice and righteousness to these offices. Father, we are past caring about political alliances or titles. We are longing for righteousness and justice. And we ask you to raise up men and women to do those things, practice those things in the offices that they win. Father, we also pray for Christians that you will give us a spirit of being peacemakers, that you will help us to be convictional and forthright in what we believe and stand for, but to do so in a way that represents uh, the Lord Jesus and his call to us to be peacemakers in our world. Father, we pray that you will work in ways that none of us can predict or understand.
to use the circumstances we're living through right now to bring about a great awakening of love and devotion to you. It's been a long time, a long time, since you have moved across our country and we've seen large numbers of people come to faith in Jesus and a turning toward righteousness of many people in behavioral uh, behavior and attitude. And we appeal to you for that kind of awakening as a result of what we're living through right now. Thank you for hearing our prayer and for working with us today. Now bless the rest of our day together as we study and learn in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's be seated, please. And as you're being seated, let me just make a brief announcement and introduce our speaker for the day. First of all, uh, the one announcement today is that on December 1st, there's a Hispanic Ministry Leaders lunch, Appreciation Luncheon here at noon at Gateway Seminary. Uh, this is going to be a very significant and consequential event. If you're watching online today and you identify in any way as, as a Hispanic leader uh, in California or the West, contact us and make arrangements to be on campus that day for this luncheon event. Then, uh, secondly, Today's Intersect at Gateway Seminary, the theme is Truth and Culture. Uh, we're starting with this chapel plenary session. We'll move into a leadership luncheon next door in the Graves Center where there'll be a question and answer dialogue with our speaker. And then we'll follow that with a short break and then at 1.30, panel discussion and breakout sessions fill up the afternoon. We are honored today to have Jay, Jay Warner Wallace as our speaker. He's Jim to his friends and we welcome him as a friend today. As you already know about him, he is a, uh, a respected author and apologist. He is a fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, teaches not only here for us at Gateway, but also at Talbot and at Southern Evangelical Seminary. He came to Christ at age 35 as a cold case detective applying his skills to the reality of the Christian faith and then becoming a follower of Jesus. But most importantly of all that, you may not know this about him, he is a graduate of Gateway Seminary, having earned the Master of Theological Studies degree from us. So will you welcome our graduate and our friend, Jim, come and talk to us today. Thanks, brother. When my wife first said, um, we should go to church, I, I didn't think much of it. I mean, I wasn't opposed to it. Um, I think neither one of us really knew what was going to happen because neither one of us had really been in an evangelical church before. So we decided to go. Um, I went like my dad would go. My dad would go to church because he thinks it's a useful delusion. He thinks it actually is helpful in raising kids. And that was really my view. My view was that, hey, this is not true, but does it really need to be true to be useful? And Susie's view was more or less, well, maybe we should do something in addition to our parenting to help, you know, raise our kids. So that's really what brought us to church to begin with. I want to share with you a little bit about that today. Now I'm going to need to get over to this presentation. I know they're going to switch over here, so I'll wait for them to do that. Now, a lot of it for me was um, about whether or not Jesus really mattered. And I wasn't willing to read your stupid book. I didn't think it was demonstrably true. It might be true for some of you as a matter of preference, but I didn't think it was demonstrably true. And for me, demonstrably true was important because my cases are all built on evidences we have to demonstrate in front of a jury. I certainly didn't think that Christianity was demonstrably true in that way. So for me, it was all about, can I make a case for this? Is there any evidence for this? Most of my cases, I work on cold cases, those are just unsolved murders. And you have to make these cases. I've been on Dateline a number of times, and you'll see that when you make them, you're trying to convince somebody at some point that it's true. Now, I actually took the time to investigate it, and at the end of that, I did think it was true based on the evidence. A couple of years ago, I was asked to do six minutes in a movie to just talk about what is, why do you think it's true evidentially? Well, that's a, it's hard to do six minutes, right? Because you have to know a lot more than six minutes worth of information. And you don't know which six minutes of information you're going to need, depending on the person you're talking to. So what I'm going to do this morning is just take some time with the book we wrote recently called Person of Interest. I want to engage you in a thought experiment because I was not really, I didn't trust the scriptures. If you're going to make the case for Jesus, you're going to have to also be able to make it outside of your Bible. Imagine a future dystopian world in which someone is able to effectively gather and destroy 
every single Bible, every single New Testament document, every single New Testament manuscript. Just imagine this could happen. Somehow you gather them all and you destroy all of them. Okay, that's the thought experiment. To me, I thought, look, if Jesus is who he said he was, I should still be able to make a case, even if there's no, if he's God incarnate, come to visit earth, I should be able to make a case from something other than just your scripture. So imagine if we destroyed all of them, how would we make that case? Well, it's kind of similar to when you work a, a criminal, I have death scenes where I walk in, because I've worked a lot of fresh homicides before I ever started working cold cases. I would worked cold cases toward the end. And I can tell you that, that my fresh homicide, you walk in, you, sometimes you have a body is still there. You'll have uh, blood spatter evidence. You'll have a weapon sometimes. You can actually get yellow tape and put it around your crime scene. But I've also had cases where there's nothing in the crime scene. Not a single thing. They're empty. That's like where a guy will kill his wife. Then he'll wait about a week, get rid of her body, come into the front desk. He'll say, you know, my wife and I, we had an argument 10 days ago, and she ran off, and she hasn't come home. So now we're 10 days behind. They assign it to an investigator like three days later. So now we're nearly two weeks behind the, the crime. The body's missing. The house has been cleaned up. I get it 30 years later. The house has been sold four times. There's no crime scene. There's not a single piece of evidence in the property room. So how do we make cases where we don't have anything evidentially? It's kind of like if it had no New Testament, how would you make a case for Jesus? Now, I always have a suspect in these cases. It's going to be the husband, OK? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's true. If you watch Dateline, you know that, that every happy marriage ends in a murder, OK? <laughs> so if you're all happy right now, it's just a matter of time. Just a matter of time. And so, so I, I suspect, but how do I know that he is my person of interest when there is no evidence in the crime scene? That's the question, right? Well, I always tell people uh, when you go in front of a jury, that look, this is not happening in isolation. Every crime is preceded by a timeline. There's a bunch of stuff that happened before the murder, and there's a bunch of stuff that happens after the murder. If I didn't know what happened on the day of the murder, I can pretty much tell you from what happened before and what happened afterwards. In other words, if she just ran off, she just ran off. But if she was killed that day, well, that was an explosive day. And explosions are caused by bombs, and all bombs have a fuse. And that fuse burns for some period of time. He was getting hostile. He was starting to cheat on her. He was getting ready, getting the materials together, whatever he needed. The day of the murder, he does something stupid, and then there's shrapnel and debris all over the blast radius. This is how bombs work, OK, guys? So if I don't know what happened on the day of the murder, I simply have to demonstrate to a jury, well, what was the fuse that was burning up to this day? That's going to give us a lot of data. And then what's the fallout that occurred afterwards? These are fuse and fallout cases. Does that make sense? Yeah. So typically in a jury trial, it's going to look so, I know you guys are already starting to take pictures and videos. I'm going to send you this video. So just relax, OK? You don't even need it. I'm going to send it to you because I know it's hard to keep up. But in a criminal trial, it looks something like this, right? There's a bunch of stuff that occurs leading up to. He's purchasing the materials to get rid of the body. He's getting ready for this. He's starting to cheat on her months and months before, all that stuff. And then afterwards, he's going to do a bunch of stuff that's going to give away the fact that he is involved in a murder. And this is what these look like in front of a jury. I know because I actually build these kinds of things for juries, OK? This is basically, I'm just showing you a jury trial. Now, I thought, though, when it came to Jesus, I should be able to do something similar. Even if I didn't have any New Testament scripture, even if I refused to read it, if he is who he said he was, wouldn't there be a fuse leading up to his appearance? And then we should have some evidence that he was here, even if there was no scripture. In other words, there ought to be a fuse, and there ought to be fallout. Now, I want to talk about today with you is a little bit about the fuse. And we can only cover so much because we're in a small chapel. So let's just jump right in. I think there are three aspects of the fuse three strands of that fuse, and there's a bunch of fallout that occur afterwards in a number of surprising areas. Now, I was trying to decide what to do with you today. I want to show you something I thought was kind of odd when I first saw it 20 plus years ago when I got 25 years ago when I got saved. So I just want to examine this part of the fallout, the spiritual part of the fallout. Now, I, I actually did attend here um, for about seven years. It took me that long to get a degree because I was working full time. And I always tell people, look, you know what? Seven years are going to go by whether you decide to do this or not, so just do it. Right. 
You're going to be seven years older with or without a degree. You might as well have a degree. So, so that's, that's how I looked at it. And as I was pastoring afterwards, as a youth pastor and as a lead pastor, I encountered things, questions about the spiritual fuse. Uh, let, let me show you what I mean. So here's a fuse that's burning up toward the first century, which is in blue there. There's 30 AD, the appearance of Jesus. You realize that there was a bunch of gods that were worshipped before Jesus, right? These are the gods of antiquity that all occur in that orange area, which is pre-Jesus. And then, of course, now there's a lot of folks right now, you probably have heard of them. They're called, I call them Jesus mythers. They are people who say, well, Jesus never even lived any more than these gods lived. As a matter of fact, he's just a recreation of these gods. He's the same old, tired, worn out, dying and rising Savior over and over and over again. As a matter of fact, when I, I was a youth pastor, I used to take my students on immersive trips to, uh, to, to help them understand if Christianity was true. I would take them to UC Berkeley every February. And at UC Berkeley, that's a great place to engage atheists. So we were on the campus at UC Berkeley. We had a professor there, and he said, came to our students. I said, you can tell our students, you, you, it's a Q&A. You have 45 minutes to present your case against Christianity, and then we're going to have a Q&A with the students. The students have been training for eight weeks. They already know what's coming. And here's what he said. He said, students, he had no idea what our students were about. He just looked at me, and he said, I'm about to blow your student's mind. I said, go for it. So up he walks, and he says, students, I want to describe a deity for you. Here is the description he puts on the screen. Students, who am I talking about? One girl I should not have brought. She was a friend of another, a student of mine. She did not go to all the training. I knew, after that, I never did that again. You had to go to all eight weeks, or you couldn't go. So she raised her hand. She says, that's Jesus. He said, no, that's not Jesus. That's Mithras. That's a Persian deity, about 400 years before Jesus. It's the story that Jesus was stolen from. That night, she said, I'm not even sure I can pray to God. Is there a God to pray to? If this is true, if this is Mithras, now, of course, everybody else knew this was not Mithras because we'd done our homework. It turns out this claim is often online. You'll see it all the time. None of this is true about Mithras, except for a couple of things. So if you really look at Mithras, none of this stuff is true, okay? Now, he did perform miracles. But if your God can't perform miracles, he's not much of a God. So why would you be surprised that someone would worship a God who performs miracles? If that's all he has in common with, with, with Jesus, that's not a lot. But I need you, need you to see what they didn't see. I've read all of the ancient mythologies, repeatedly looking for the similarities between all ancient mythologies. And in the book, I write about 15 common characteristics between all ancient gods. I want to show you a couple. For example, it's pretty common, not everyone, but most of these guys, uh, their coming is somehow foretold by somebody in the past. It's part of the story. And, but that to me is, a, I would expect that, right? If you've been thinking about God, and by the way, 86% of humans on planet Earth today believe there's a higher power, they think about God. They always, we've always been thinking about God, and we've been talking about it. So the fact that you might recall somebody who was talking about God before you does not surprise me. So why would this surprise you? And you'll see that in many ancient mythologies, this kind of thing is common. But I would expect that. Here's another similarity. Some, not all, but a lot, have some royal heritage. But it seems to me if I'm an ancient and I'm thinking that God has power, the only other analogous uh, being that has power is whoever's ruling us. So everyone thinks that God has the power of a king. Uh, duh. And so you'll see this over and over again in ancient. This, to me, also does not strike me as all that odd. If you're thinking about God, you probably think of these two attributes. Uh, some, but not all, have... Um, an unusual way in which they appear in the world. Supernatural. Well, I think if you're thinking about God, you're thinking, okay, look, he's supernatural. He's extra natural. He's outside of nature. He's probably going to appear in some outside of nature way. Mithras pops out of the side of a mountain, leaving a hole. That's pretty supernatural. <laughs> but I think that's something you would expect. And you do see this uh, on many other gods. But to say that that somehow is, is, is approximates a virgin birth, to me, 
um, is, now you will see some that will have, they will come into the planet without any sexual intercourse. Okay, you're God. I can see why you might think that. Make sense? So I'm going to show you all 15. Here they are. The first three, two across the top, and the first one here we talked about, but these are all of them. Now, obviously I couldn't go through all these with you today, but I want to put them on a, on a chart with you. So here's our timeline again. And I'm going to put the gods in the timeline, in the actual order in which they appear in history. They'll be at the bottom. As the fuse is burning up to the first century, above each god is a column in which I show you what attributes it has that are shared with other gods. So now you have a chart in which you can see each one in its attributes. Does that make sense? OK. You might notice right away that there's only, some only have as many as four common attributes, four to six are the bottom of the range. The top of the range is only 10. No one's got more than 10 of the 15 attributes, but there are several that have 10. Here's four, for example, that have 10 of the 15 attributes. Now, why I show you this? Because no one is saying, in the criticism of Buddhism, the Buddha is a, a figure that was recreated from ancient mythologies like Osiris. No one says that about Buddha. Well, you could say it about Buddha. Look how much he shares with, with Osiris. He shares it also with Dionysus. He shares it with Zoroaster. But no one is saying that Buddha is a recreation because he, clearly he's not. And so, they're, and the, the, by the way, these have more in common with each other than they do with Jesus. So this idea that Jesus is somehow a recreation. No, Jesus epitomizes common notions about deity. I will go the other way. Let's go horizontally for a second. I want to show you the attributes that are the most common. So here, for example, this row, everyone can work a miracle. Okay. Everyone can do God stuff. Okay, we got that. Here, most, but not all, end up appearing miraculously. You can see how many are in the gaps there in the horizontal line. Uh, most, but not all, can defeat death because they're gods. <laughs> Most, but not all, can actually provide eternal life for others because they're gods. This, to me, I don't know why we would even flinch at this. But here's what I thought was interesting. If you look, go back to our chart for a second. Here's everybody again. Here's what I noticed. Of the 15 most common things that ancients and moderns think God ought to be able to be or do, no one has all 15. They're somewhere between 6 and 10 until you get to Jesus. And there suddenly all 15 attributes are personified. He is the only one that completely personifies everyone's expectation of deity. Does that make sense? He's the one. To me, this is not an evidence against Jesus. It's an evidence for Jesus. This is what C.S. Lewis says. He says, now the story of Christ is simply a true myth a myth working on us in the same way as the others, but with this tremendous difference that it really happened. And one must be content to accept it in the same way, remembering that it's God's myth, where the others are men's myths. The pagan stories are God expressing himself through the minds of poets, using such images as he found there, while Christianity is God expressing himself through what we call, yeah, uh, what's that called? Real stuff, real things. But it's not just in the pagan stories about God that you see Jesus. Let me show you a biblical description. He could have easily asked the same question to my students. Who am I describing here? Sounds like Jesus, but it's not Jesus, but it's from the Bible. This is Joseph. I'll show you another one. Now the contest begins. Sounds like Jesus. Who's that? This sounds like Jesus. It's not Jesus. Who's that? This sounds like Jesus. Not Jesus. Who's that? One more. This sounds like Jesus.
You see what's happening here? It's not just that Jesus best personifies the expectations of pagans. It's that he also best personifies the expectations of the Jews because all the patriarchs. That's the most robust description you will get of Jesus anywhere. And it's not Jesus. It's just the combination of all the expectations of the patriarchs. And, and by the way, none of them has the complete story, of course, that you would expect in God incarnate because it turns out all of them have a piece of it that then, as history burns toward the first century, only one person has all of it. Here we are again. It's Jesus in the first century. Make sense? And you might ask the question, why would God do it this way? Why would he take these expectations, these reasonable expectations of non-Jews, and then add those to the expectations of the Jews through the patriarchs to end up with the most robust description of Jesus? Why would that happen? I think it's all in the word expectations, because expectations require two things. They require expectors, and they require the expected. Here's what I mean by that. Um, I worked a lot of years undercover before I started working homicides. My, I had, you know, didn't cut my hair for four years. It was awesome. And I was working mostly surveillances of local crimes. So if you had a guy who was doing a burglary and you weren't sure if he was your burglar, you would just sit on the guy until he did a burglary in front of you, and then you would take him to jail. But if you don't know who's doing it, you do this terrible thing called geographic surveillances where you're just sitting in neighborhoods that get hit. What are the odds? Neighborhoods are large. What are the odds that six guys sitting in six cars parked on six streets out of hundreds of streets are going to dumb into a burglar? Not good, but we did it. And I was out there one day, and I'm sitting on a neighborhood, and sure enough, I hear the radio, police radio. I'm monitoring it in my car. I'm in an unmarked car, and I'm not wearing a police uniform. But I hear a call go out for a police car to come and talk to a victim who had just come home. He went out to the market, came back to his apartment, and sure enough, he had been burglarized. He was just two blocks away from me. I was so upset I missed it by two blocks. So I decided to jump the call, drive over there, and talk to this guy before the police officer got there and take the report. Because for all I know, I could ask a few questions. Maybe he saw something that will help us. Maybe these guys are still out there walking around. Let me go find out. I drive over there. I'm in a car like this, a little stanza. I jump out of the stanza, and I don't look like me. I look like the old me, OK? <laughs> So I jump out and I start talking to him, and he will not give me the time of day. He won't say anything to me, and I'm getting angry. Meanwhile, up drives a patrol car, and this, unit guy, he, this officer comes out, and he's very cooperative with this guy. Well, what is happening here? Well, he had called for a police car, and when he, the first guy showed up, I didn't meet his expectations. This guy did, and there is the key. It turns out that when the expected meets the expectations of the expector, you get better results. Make sense? Not just true of cops. It's true of deity also. This is what Paul is talking about. You people, you people are very religious. I've noticed you haven't got a tomb, a monument here to the unknown God. Really? Well, you've been imagining things about God. I'm here to tell you we actually met him. Let me tell you about him. He actually meets all of your expectations. This is what's happening with Jesus. Now, I want to show you the weirdest thing before we break for the rest of the day. Because sometimes what gives away a suspect is not necessarily where a crime occurs, but when a crime occurs. Because if you're the only guy who's available to do the crime at that time, you're probably the guy. Does that make sense? So I'm always timelining everybody to see, is he available? Well, here's a timeline, a spiritual fuse timeline. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put on this timeline. I'm going to put everyone, who, every god, at these ones I showed you at least, and when they are worshipped. So, for example, this is Osiris. He's worshipped from this date to this date. He is no longer worshipped, okay? And I'm going to do that now with every god that I showed you on that timeline. I just want you to look at the overlaps. Because you'll see as I put these on here that there will be some overlaps. And I just want you to see where those are. Now, why I'm showing you this with all the overlaps is because if I am the true God of the universe who has designed humans in his image with an expectation of me as God, 
and I want to come to planet Earth, it might be wise to come when everyone is still worshiping their expectations, because I'm going to meet all those expectations. In other words, if I want to have the most impact globally, which might explain why Christianity takes off, I should probably come in the best part of the overlap, which happens to be right here. I call this red zoning. So I do this for criminal cases all the time. This is, this is where you'd want to come. That's a pretty big red zone, though. A lot of things happen in that red zone. But let me add to something else maybe you hadn't thought about. If you want the story of Jesus to travel fast, you could take advantage of the cultural history. Remember I said there was a spiritual fuse? There's also a cultural fuse. It turns out the Roman Empire was a huge advantage for, for Jesus because the Roman Empire comes and it solidifies language, the Etruscan alphabet, the materials you need to write and travel with materials on papyrus, the Koine Greek language, also a, a, a time of stability, conquering the entire known world around the Mediterranean, and even being the largest and most uh, efficient builder of roads, builder of roads and bridges and tunnels. No one did it like the Romans. Persians did a good job, but not like the Romans. Not only that, there's a period of peace, a 200-year period of peace right here called the Pax Romana, so that all of the money that used to be spent on war can now be spent on infrastructure, more roads. Two of the three churches mentioned by John in Revelation were evangelized on roads by Paul on roads that didn't exist just 100 years earlier. Those roads got Paul to those cities because of the Romans. So now if you wanted to take advantage of the 200-year period of peace and all of the roads, and you overlap that over the spiritual fuse, look how small your red zone is. But there's a prophetic red zone because it turns out that the ancient prophets were predicting the arrival of, of the Messiah. One of them is a guy named Daniel, and he predicts the Messiah is going to come between the restoration of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. Well, that's a window we can actually lock into time. So if you wanted to come and meet the expectation of the prophets, overlap it. Look how small your red zone is now. 29 BC to 70 AD. There it is. If you show up in that red zone, huge impact. This just happens to be when we mark time. In the middle third is the life of Jesus. Could it be that we call this the common era? If you don't believe in AD and BC, you're still calling it something. Why are you calling it the common era? Because the person who changed it is a person. What changed it is a person who came right in that red zone and divided time. So we talked about, we started with this idea of a fuse and fallout. We didn't talk about any of the fallout, sorry. But I will tell you briefly, the fallout matters because no one has impacted literature, art, music, education, science, or world religions as much as Jesus of Nazareth. I don't know if you've ever thought of it. But for example, no one has been written about more than Jesus of Nazareth. Any library you want to go to that's either global, we have a great library at the Library of Congress. It's the largest collection of printed volumes anywhere on planet Earth. But Google Books will also confirm this. The next guy down in historical figures from Jesus is way down. No one's been written about. There's no such thing in literature called Buddha figuring, but it turns out Christ figuring happens all the time. Have you watched anything on Star Wars? Have you watched anything in Marvel? These are Christ figures. That story keeps on being reiterated over and over again. And from just the literature, from non-Christian sources in the first 300 years of the Common Era, you can recreate all of this information. So if you don't have any New Testament, but you have literature from the first 300 years of the Common Era, this is what you would know about Jesus. That's the kind of impact he's had on literature. When it comes to art, no one has been imaged. Now, I have a weird background, so I became a detective after a career as an architect. So I, my bachelor's degree is in design, fine arts. My master's degree is in architecture from UCLA. And then I became a cop. So then I became a detective. So it was a little bit of a weird path. This is, I love this. I had no idea. And here I was studying the masters. Well, they were all images of Jesus. No one's been painted, etched, sculpted more than Jesus, not just in the West, globally. Just do the work. Art history is divided into isms. 
Expressionism, Impressionism, Dadaism, Popism, I don't care what ism you're into. Google the top three masters globally. All of those masters have seen and used Jesus as an inspiration. No one shows up in art this often. Nobody. As a matter of fact, I don't, I'm sure that Andy Warhol is not a Christian. But Andy Warhol used to paint him a bunch of Jesus. So people are frustrated and infuriated, but they're inspired in some way by Jesus. No one else comes close. And just from the art before the Dark Ages, you can reconstruct every scene in every gospel. We did it with the gospel. This is the gospel of Mark. Every one of these scenes in the gospel of Mark, you have to destroy all of those surfaces, all of those paintings and sculptures to get rid of Jesus. And you can reconstruct this entire life from art before the Dark Ages. Not only that, music. Whatever you like in music, whatever your genre of music is that you love, if you know anything about music history, you are standing on the shoulders of Jesus and his followers. Are you using musical notation? I saw he was doing that today. You were doing that, Ruben, right? You have your music on here. Well, you don't have music notation until Christians invent it for the church. Singing harmonies, you were playing backup um, uh, harmonies on your guitar. Harmonies are a function, the church invented those. Major scales, minor scales, the church invented those. Everything you think you know about music, what place in the world do people come every week to sing in front of an audience? That's called the church, folks. We've mastered this. We crush it. I went ahead and just looked at every single Billboard, IMDb, Rolling Stone magazine, every genre got a master list of all the bands going back 150 years. They're not Christian bands, OK? looked at every single catalog of every single artist, all but two had a song about Jesus. Frank Zappa's got a great song. It's called Jesus Thinks You're a Jerk. But it's still a song about Jesus. <laughs> you just cannot ignore this guy. And from just the music in the first 300 years of the Common Era, you can reconstruct every detail of the Jesus story. And most of the theology is much richer. Science and education. The science fathers, every major scientific discipline, I should have done this talk today because this is the one that blows people away. You don't realize that every major scientific discipline from quantum mechanics back to astronomy has as its source a Christian thinker who is called the father of that discipline. And the fathers of all of the major scientific disciplines all the way into today, quantum mechanics isn't that old, if you look at them and they are actually right about Jesus. Not only that, the top 15 universities the university, as you know it, is a Christian invention. You know that, right? Bologna, Paris, and Oxford. It's from those three that the next 22 daughter universities emerge. From those 22 daughter universities, all the scientists came from the scientific revolution. It turns out that that is where science is grounded in the history of Christianity. It's coming out of the monasteries and the cathedral schools to the universities. And if you go back and visit the top 15 universities in the world today, I don't care what, really, what metric you're using, the top 15 were all founded by Christians. Go to those campuses. They love to keep their old buildings. Go to their oldest buildings. Who do you think you're going to find there? From just the campuses of the top 15 universities, I did this, you can reconstruct the entire Jesus story. Are you willing to destroy those campuses to get rid of Jesus? You'd have to. And the entire, you can get way more from the science fathers about who Jesus is than you can from the church fathers. I've done it both ways. Way more from the science. It's not even close. Also, when it comes to world religions, every, all these world religions had to Jesus. They all love Jesus. If you're a Buddhist, your, your leaders are talking about Jesus. There's a place for Jesus within Buddhism. If you're a Hindu, these things precede Jesus. They, don't, they went back and they worked him in. And if you're following Jesus, Baha'i, Ahmadi Muslims, Muslims, they're on the pages of their scripture. Meanwhile, Jesus says, uh, sorry, guys. There's no place for you here, even though most of these preceded him. He doesn't, do the, doesn't return the favor. And just from the scripture and teaching of world religious leaders other than Christians, you can learn this about Jesus. You'd have to destroy. I don't care where. If you're a Muslim in the world today, you know something about Jesus. If you're a Christian in the world today, you may not know anything about Muhammad. That's just the way it works. He's had more impact than anyone else. Why? Why would we change our calendars for this knucklehead? Tell me why. Seriously. How could this guy be the guy? Let me show you everyone else in the first century of note. Here they are. 
You don't even recognize most of those people. They didn't have an impact. We didn't change our calendar for them. They had no impact on literature, art, music, education, science, and world religions like Jesus did. Here are the people who are just like the best world leaders, the most has been written about historically. None of these people impacted art, literature, music, education, science, and world religions either. These are the people who said they were God or led religious movements. They haven't impacted literature, art, music, education, science, and world religions either. These are the people who said they were the Jewish Messiah. Yeah, a bunch of these exist about the 13th century. None of these people changed the calendar either. Instead, it's this guy from some small nowhere town who goes to another small nowhere town. This guy, who only has three years to make an impact, who the people who were religious rejected, the people who were powerful wanted him dead, the people who said they were his friends abandoned him. He didn't have a formal education. He didn't have an expensive family structure. He never had a house he lived in, never had a family or kids of his own. He never, never uh, ruled a nation, never uh, led an army, never wrote a sonnet. This guy who was falsely accused and brutally beaten then had to be buried in a borrowed grave. This is the guy that changes the calendar, that changes everything. You tell me how that could be. See, this for me, I look at this and I say, okay, can you think of a fictional character that can have this impact on history? Even now, who could it be? Like maybe Harry Potter or, or Luke Skywalker. I'm not trying, like, who is the fictional character? Well, there's no one from the past, but I can't even think of one going forward. And if, and if there's no fictional character who can do this, you have now good reason to think he's not just a fictional character. Jesus is not a fictional character because fictional characters don't do this. But also, what other human mortal has ever done this? I'm waiting. That's why I think it's reasonable to infer he's something other than a human mortal. In other words, this top part speaks to his historicity. This bottom part speaks to his deity. Look, if you had no other evidence, and you have three options when it comes to Jesus, right? You only have three options. He's either a dude who lived, he's a man, or he's a lie, he's a myth, or he's the Messiah. Those are the three. Given the impact that Jesus has had and how he falls in that fuse that burns up to the first century, tell me which of these three is the more reasonable uh, inference. Only the one in the middle makes any sense. And that's why I think he's more than a person of interest. As a matter of fact, I think he's the God who we should be sharing with everybody because he should be of interest to everybody. As a matter of fact, as an atheist, I will tell you what was it of impact to me. Did Jesus matter to me? Well, not really, but I'll tell you what did matter to me as an atheist. What mattered to me were the things that mattered to most, most atheists, literature and art and music and science and education. Yet none of these things would exist as they are today, if it wasn't for Jesus. But that's not why he matters. He doesn't matter because he influenced the world. It turns out he just the opposite. He influenced the world because he always mattered. So I'm going to send you stuff from our, uh, this whole talk from our uh, website, which is Cold Case Christianity. And uh, my son also is a detective. He's been there about 11 years. He also writes on this page also. Um, but if you missed anything today, I'm going to send it to you. Now, don't complain about how I'm sending this. Don't complain about my phone number. I didn't pick this number. <coughs> Pardon me, it was assigned to me. It's got a lot of sixes. I know you Christians get freaked out about sixes. But you're just going to det text the word detective to the number 66866. Text the word detective to the number 66866. And I'm going to send you the videos, you're going to have to download them, though, on your computer because I'm going to send you the full-length videos in every category of the fallout, every category, so you'll have it. But I'm also going to send you why the Bible is reliable from inside. This is a case for, for Christianity outside in. But, of course, the case can be made from inside Scripture out. And we do that also, or I'm going to send you that as well, okay? Let's pray. Father, we know that... Um, this is a great day that we can use to grow our understanding, to grow our ability to make a case, to grow our ability to share with the people around us. And like a lot of us, maybe we're convinced, we've been convinced for years, but a lot of us in this room, we're raising up teenagers. We're raising up middle schoolers. And we already know that they're not as interested as we are. So help us, Father to show them why Jesus still matters. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Everyone here says, amen. amen. Thanks.
All right, we're going to go uh, quickly to the leadership luncheon. If you've registered for that, uh, get your lunch and meet us in the Grave Center. If not, check with somebody in the foyer. Maybe they'll have an extra lunch. You can still squeeze in. Let's do that quickly, and we'll start the question and answer dialogue time about 1225. Okay, thanks. Thank you.